For the next several months, we're going to take a, a deep dive into how the 12 steps operate to facilitate the achievement of emotional sobriety. Tonight, we're going to continue to explore step one, and Mary is going to be my discussant. So the way that it works is that I will discuss some of the psychological and spiritual forces operating in this step. And then I'll leave Mary about, I'll do that for about 20 minutes and I'll leave Mary about 10 minutes to go ahead and, and to add her perspective. Um, I thought last week you sweetened the pot tremendously, Mary. So thank you so much for your contribution. Now, after we're done, um, you're gonna have an opportunity to share. We're gonna leave a half an hour. Each of you will have two minutes uh, if you choose to share. You can do so by raising your hand. I think you all know how to do that. Tom is going to be our timer tonight at one and a half minutes into your share. He's going to announce that you have 30 seconds remaining. Please begin to wrap up your discussion at that point. And at two minutes, he will announce that your time is up. So let's, um, let's go ahead and just review a little bit just to, to create some continuity about what we're talking about is one of the things that I think is important to note and for us to continue to be aware of is that there's a certain amount of energy that is created when we're working a particular step. Now that we're on step one, and there's a certain amount of charge that starts to develop. And that charge is necessary because that energy is going to, to compel us and move us towards step two. And that's where it becomes so important, I think, to work these things sequentially, because there's a very, very specific therapeutic effect that happens by working step one and, and allowing that step to move you to a place where you're ready for step two. And you're going to see that. It's, it's a remarkable, remarkable process. Now, we can talk about that in terms of physical sobriety because step one is first part of that is about we admit it, we were powerless over alcohol, right? But we're going to be focusing our discussions not on the physical sobriety here, but on what that step means in terms of the achievement of emotional sobriety. So I just wanted to kind of re, you know, capture that, that, that energy, that essence before we begin. And we talked last time, I, I think it's really um, a good way to think of this step one is kind of our wake up call. And what are we waking up to, right? Is when we think about admitting that we were powerless, what we're waking up to is, is the fact that there are limitations in our life. And we talked about that, that an important component of emotional sobriety is humility. And uh, I was able to read a definition from uh, the psychology dictionary last week. And I just want to repeat that again, because I think it's such an important definition. So this is from the American Psychological Association's dictionary of psychological terms and they go humility is the quality of being humble and it is characterized by a low focus on the self an accurate not an over or under estimate uh, estimated sense of one's accomplishments and worth and an acknowledgement of one's limitations imperfections mistakes gaps in knowledge and so on now we're going to see that Emotional sobriety is not possible without the attainment of this, of a degree of humility in our lives. Now, when I first came in the program, which was quite some time ago now, back in 1971, there was a, a common um, idea passed around about step one when I'd go to the 12 step workshops and that or the 12 step meetings that focused on going through the steps. And they said, well, step one really is the only step that you can take 100%. And I think that's true in terms of the first half of step one is that when we admit we're powerless, 
But the second part, right, that our lives had become unmanageable. I think that is something that continues to be revealed to us throughout our lives. Because what we're going to discover is we walk through these steps that a lot of the unenforceable rules that are generated by our emotional dependency are mostly outside of our awareness. Now, that's not to say there isn't low-hanging fruit and things that we're very aware of, you know. God, this is an expectation I have. I can see that one. But what's going to happen is as you trudge that road of happy destiny in your life, you're going to find yourself getting upset about things. And that's where you're going to have an opportunity to start to become aware of those things, those unenforceable rules that are operating outside of your awareness. And what makes it important to become aware of those? Well, what we're seeing in step one is that the first thing that we're doing is really accepting our powerlessness. Now, that's not an easy task. I went back over the, the step one in the, in the 12 and 12 today. And these are some of the different things that Bill was saying about step one. And, and, and they're powerful statements because they're really true. He says, who, want, who cares to admit defeat, right? Nobody cares to admit defeat. He says, every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. Now, he's relating all of these things in the 12 and 12 to our relationship to alcohol. But I want you, as I say these things, to think about our relationship to life. Because remember, what, what we need to become aware of is we've had the cart before the horse, is that we've demanded life to be a certain way for us to be okay, rather than figuring out what we need to do to cope with life as it is. So he goes, every natural instinct cries out against this idea of personal powerlessness, because there was early on in our lives that we decided we were going to control life so that it would be what we think we needed it to be for us to be okay. He goes, but upon entering AA, we soon take another view of this absolute humiliation. He goes, we perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first steps towards liberation and strength. Now, here is when we are introduced to paradox in the importance of paradox in the achievement of emotional sobriety. You know, there's there in gestalt therapy, I was trained as a gestalt therapist, and it's a it's a form of therapy that was co-founded by Fritz Perls and his wife, Laura Perls. And a part of Gestalt therapy is this idea of what they call a paradoxical theory of change. And the paradoxical theory of change says, as soon as I own what I am doing, instead of trying to be someone I'm not, then change becomes possible. So when I admit to my powerlessness, I'm able to discover some kind of a different power. If I own that I'm a liar, I start to become honest. If I learn that I compromise my integrity, or if I own that I compromise my integrity and learn that, then, and, and I'm able to really, really own it, now keeping integrity becomes possible. But that's a very different way than I think all of us have lived our lives is that we're told, well, you know, if you're going to make a change, just try to be what you want to be. Even in the program, we hear act as if, right? Well, what's happening in step one is that we're getting a very different idea of this. It's not about acting as if, it's about owning what's going on for us. So the admission is a big part of that. Acceptance is also a big part of that. Bill goes on, he goes, he says, the admission of personal powerlessness finally turns out to be the firm bedrock upon which happy and purposeful lives may be built. Now, remember, he's thinking about that in terms of relationship to alcohol, but I want you to think about that now in relationship to life. Our admission of our personal powerlessness, meaning I have no business putting my expectations and trying to control life to be what I want it to be. 
That's the admission of my personal powerlessness in terms of emotional sobriety. That's what I need to admit and accept. That becomes a firm bedrock because with that, with my awareness of that, with my admission of that, my acceptance of that, I can start to surrender my hobbling expectations. And when I surrender those expectations, then I'm able to start learning how to cope with what is rather than arguing about what is, rather than objecting about what is. So Bill goes on, he says, well, little good can come to any alcoholic unless he has first accepted his devastating weakness and all its consequences. Meaning for him, he's talking about alcoholism is a disease, right? Our relationship to alcohol. But I think we also need to understand emotional dependency is the same issue. Emotional dependency is, is a devastating weakness because it puts our emotional center of gravity outside of ourselves. It makes us so dependent on what's going on around us to be okay. And so we end up being incredibly reactive to things that are going on, especially when they don't go our way. He says, until he so humbles himself, his sobriety, if any, will be precarious. Well, the same thing with, with emotional sobriety. Until that I understand that my job is not to regulate those people around me and those circumstances around me. It's to learn how to regulate myself. If I get that, now I start to head on the right path. Now I start to head on a path that's going to help me achieve emotional sobriety. Well, he goes on to say the principle that we shall, um, the principle that we shall find no enduring strength until we first admit complete defeat is the main taproot from which our society has sprung and has flowered. And he says, and most of us revolt to that idea. We're resistant to that idea. So what we're, what's happening in this first step is that we are seeing that one of our limitations that we haven't accepted in life is that we have had this idea that life is supposed to be a certain way for us to be okay. That's the big confrontation that we're making as we start to work these steps from a perspective of emotional sobriety, that my ideas about how things are supposed to be are the problem. They are not the solution. And because I never was able to look at my ideas from that perspective before, because what we say is the consciousness that's creating the problem cannot solve it, right? The way I'm looking at the situation makes it impossible for me to see that, that these ideas about how things are supposed to be are my problem. Because they feel normal to me. They feel like this is the way life is supposed to be. And I'll tell you, I can go back and listen in my family to all of the supposed tos. There were a lot of them. You know, my grandfather said my dad wasn't supposed to die before him. You're supposed to bury your son. My mom was saying you're not supposed to lose your husband when he's 39 years old. You're supposed to grow old with him. And that those themes went on and on and on as I looked back. They were all over the place, the supposed tos. So this becomes an incredibly powerful, what I call, it kind of shatters our reliance on this consciousness that came from our false self. And the false self being the self that we engineered, the engineered self, the self that we constructed to make certain that we feel this emotional security that we feel love, that we feel like we belong, um, that, that we feel this, this emotional sense of connectedness. So this false self we engineered thinking if I could be this way, then things were gonna work. And part of this way was trying to control the conditions and circumstances that surrounded me. 
So that's what we're out. Now, when I admit this thing and when I start to see this and I really own the extent that this has created the unmanageability in my life. Now let's look at the second part of that step that my life had become unmanageable. Yes, we can look at it in terms of our relationship to alcohol or whatever kind of drug or behavior that you were involved in that was creating problems. But when you start to look at your unmanageability from this perspective, that your ideas on how things were supposed to be is what created the unmanageability in your life. And that what we tried to do was manipulate people, places, and things to get them to correspond to these perfectionist specifications, as Bill calls them, about how things were supposed to be. And it does create unmanageability because it turns into, I've got to try to control you. It creates a lot of conflict in relationships. We throw people out of our lives because they're not adhering to our rules and thinking that they're toxic. And I love that one, right? This whole thing of, of toxic people in our lives and get rid of those toxic people. Well, to me, what it means a lot of times they're toxic. They're not going along with the, what, we, what we want them to do. <laughs> I mean, and so me protecting them, my, my beliefs by calling them toxic, I'm saying you're wrong, my beliefs are right. And that's not gonna get me growing anywhere. No, I'm not saying that we got to like everyone because that's not what emotional sobriety is about either. It's as we become emotionally sober and as we become emotionally mature, we choose and we pick relationships and we don't feel like we have to feel the same way about everybody in our life. We can have certain people that we're closer to than others, that that can be part of the experience that we have. So um, when we look at the step from that perspective, we're seeing that this emotional dependency we have that has turned us into control freaks, trying to control the people and conditions surrounding us has caused us a ton of trouble. And that we're not going to, you know, turn this thing around or turn our lives around or turn ourselves around unless we can see the fatal nature of our condition, that our emotional dependency and our emotional immaturity is our problem and that we need to start growing up. So that's, that's the invitation of the first step. That's to me, the therapeutic effect of this first step is, is to create this, this sense that the way I'm doing this is not gonna work. The way that I've been doing it is causing a lot of problem in my life and has created this unmanageability in my life and that I need to discover some new possibilities. And that's what I'm left with though, because all I know is what I've been doing. And now with step one, I realize that I don't know anything any better. Now in psychology, we call that space. When you come to that space, you have now, you are experiencing what we call an existential crisis. What you've been doing, that well has been poisoned. You can't go back to it because you know it's not working. But you don't have any better alternatives developed yet. You know that if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to get, get not, we say different results. We, we think oftentimes they're going to be better and they're not. Things keep getting worse. And we see that with this emotional dependency. It's just the same progression that occurs with our illness. Things don't get better. Things get worse in our lives. So this existential crisis is now I'm really in a dilemma. I don't want to go back and keep doing what I've been doing because it's not working. It's creating a mess in my life. But I don't have any viable option. All I know is what I know. All I can do is what I've been doing. And so now I've hit this existential crisis. And a lot of people don't understand the importance of allowing yourself to sit in that anxiety. My God, <laughs> you know, we want to fix it because it feels so damn uncomfortable. You know, I want to go ahead and wrap it up and put a little bow on it and stick it on the shelf and say it's resolved. But staying with this energy, this realization that I'm messing up my life and I don't know any better. 
and I don't have any other possibility at this point in time. That's the energy that this step is creating, that existential crisis. And that crisis becomes incredibly important for the, what's going to happen to us as, as this program continues to unfold for us. So with that said, I will turn it over to Mary and, and look forward to her comments. Mary, would you unmute yourself first? Thank you. There I go. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And my name is Mary, and I, I, I want my life to get better, and I want to be more emotionally mature and sober. And I love um, step one. And I, I, I enjoyed what you said about that, Alan. And, and I, a couple things popped up in my head about it's the if onlys. If only they would understand. If only they would do it differently. If only they would understand me better instead of looking within myself. When I think about, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. We admitted we were powerless over our emotions. We admitted we were powerless over whatever. I think in the, in the course of the last three decades of my recovery, I've had periods where things have been, you know, going pretty smoothly. And then what you talked about the anxiety of, of uh, not knowing right where I was at or who I was in that moment. And, and uh, the emotional immaturity, and it still comes up, of course, but I think about three things that happen for all of us in recovery, and that is, and they are blocks, self-preoccupation. When I'm self-preoccupied, Instead of, you know, delving into, well, what's going on inside of me, but not staying there, you know, asking questions is important. So self-preoccupation can be a block. Expectations in, in, uh, can be a block. And also entitlement. I'm entitled. I deserve. And I deserve for people to treat me better. I deserve for people to see me in a certain way. And I thought of this one little phrase when you were talking about, you know, if about other people and, and people that are not in our lives necessarily because they might be toxic and because we push them away. And I always think about the lessons now that I le have learned over the years in different relationships I've been in, whether that's been friendships, work relationships. When I am upset, of course, I didn't know this before because I, ha I hadn't really you know, worked it deeply that the, the, of course the disturbance is within me and I'm the one who needs to grow. They don't need to change at all. I need to change my attitude about what is going on with them. And also I, I think about uh, when you're talking about, you know, I always like the, when we read the part about emotional um, sobriety from Bill Wilson's perspective and the 17 year old, the perspective of the 17 year old. And I love it, you know, when I work with families and there's teenager in the family, I love to see the dynamics of that. The adults who are 40 and 50 who are dealing with a 17 year old. And then I see the whole thing unfold. And I think to myself, I feel, feel like I can identify a lot with the 17 year old. And then I have to examine that and say, whoa, wait a minute, Mary, you're way past 17. And yet I still have that attitude of a 17 year old. So. Uh, in thinking about those three things, self-preoccupation, expectations, and entitlement, those three can be blocks to my emotional sobriety. And, and then I, I think about if I was asking someone, asking you, Alan, or asking anyone who's at, at this meeting tonight to describe themselves, just describe who you think you are, and then totally sit back and just let go of that image of who you think you are and feel the anxiety of that. Feel the anxiety of letting go of the image you projected out to everybody of who you are. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, emotions, work, cravings, whatever, and our life has become unmanageable. Your life will become unmanageable again 
when you let go of some image you think you are. And I'm just a real quick story from my family. I had a very large family, four brothers, one sister, Italian and Irish, and I was right in the middle. So to the younger siblings, the question would, I would project this image that I knew the answer to whatever, you know, it was an alcoholic family. And uh, so then the, the, the pattern became, ask Mary, Mary knows. And that really stayed with me for a long time until I picked up alcohol, which relieved me of, I don't need to know anymore. So then coming into sobriety and of course, powerlessness in that first step, I, I had no idea who I was. I had no idea who I was. And I love it that the steps are in order. And I love it that the first three are about surrender. But focusing on the first one, I love what you said about, oh, yes, we're powerless over alcohol, but we're powerless over the, and our life becomes unmanageable, not just from the alcohol, but from the image we project out there to other people or to the expectations that we have, or to the preoccupation we have, self-preoccupation, and to the entitlement that we think we have. And coming to an emotional sobriety meeting, before I come to the meeting, I think about, okay, have a beginner's mind, Mary, have a beginner's mind and be open to listening. And, and from that beginner's mind, learn something about yourself and, and how you can grow emotionally, how you can be emotionally sober. And I'm laughing because my one of my friends, Claudia, is here tonight. And I had a really wonderful Thanksgiving with friends. There was just four of us. We were all masked up and we did social distance and we still enjoyed the company of each other. But we got to talking about some things and I realized on the way home that some knowing that we were going to have emotional sobriety meeting tonight, I thought, whoa, there was an area that I need to work on in my, my perception of so, not the people that we were visiting, not Claudia and Dan, but of some of the folks that I had worked with years ago and a perception that I had of them and that powerlessness of, and unmanageability of my life because of that perception. So I don't know if that helps any, but I, it just gave me food for thought when you were talking about, yeah, the first step is, you know, there's two parts to it. We admitted we were powerless over whatever our craving was and that our life had become unmanageable. And then, la and then so I would just invite anybody to describe yourself to someone you know, and then let go of that image and see how you feel. Sit in the anxiety that Alan talks about. And let's see, I had one other thing I jotted down and then I'll close with this. Uh, who do they? Oh, I know, I wanted to quote my mother, my little short Italian mother. When any of us got emotionally upset in our family, she, she used to say things like, get over yourself, get next to yourself and get a hold of yourself. And we always thought that was really not very, you know, like, oh, what's she talking about? Very but good. now when I look at emotional sobriety, I think that's pretty profound. <laughs> get over yourself, get next to yourself. It's like, get outside of yourself, look at what you're doing and then get a hold of yourself. Yeah. And don't we talk about that in, in all the programs, all the 12 step programs about having emotional sobriety. So that's all I have to offer tonight. And uh, thanks for letting me part, be part of this discussion, Alan. No, no, that's great, Mary. I, I love that. Move over, Bill Wilson. Make room for, for Mary's mom. <laughs> yeah, that, that is very insightful on your mom's part. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what you say always triggers some thoughts on my part is that um, it's interesting and I hadn't put together before how this idea of how life is supposed to be is really an attitude of entitlement. Is that somehow... I get to dictate what life yeah. is supposed to be. Yeah. Right. So you can. Re I've never put that those two things together the way that you just talked about it, but it's a real attitude of entitlement that somehow I get to demand what's what's going to go on in life. You right. know, talk about arrogance. I mean, that's that's incredible. 
So yeah. what I'd like you to discuss tonight in, in terms of discussing this step about powerlessness is that what has been your experience of, of f- facing your unmanageability? Oh, that was the second thing I was gonna say. Ernie Larson says a very interesting thing. He says, many people find the first half of step one the easiest to take. I'm powerless over alcohol. Not that it's easy, but that they can accept that but it's the unmanageability part that becomes even more challenging. I think he's right about that. I do think that that's where a lot of us find ourselves after we've been in a program for a while and now things aren't working the way that we think that they should be, find ourselves stuck. So it's an important part. So I just want you to share tonight, if you would be willing to, is just where you're at with that in terms of how much, how you've been able to, or where you've struggled at accepting that unmanageability uh, about expectations for other people, um, this idea of trying to control things around you. It's just, what is your experience of that in your life today? Mm-hmm. 